afraid of let's sing some songs together God so loved the world come on
and all. You are my strength when I am old. You are the treasures that I see. You are my
presence with us. Let's, amen, pray at this point in our service for our leaders. We're going to lift up uh, the Mitchells, the Moraleses, 
Let's also pray for the Galvans, the Hearts, and those uh, Acasios assisting in Prescott, Arizona. That's our grandmother church. Pray for their families. Pray for their finances. Pray for all that God is doing there. Let's also pray for the East Coast. Uh, had a tremendous time in conference last week. I've got some good announcements. Amen. Let's pray for Pastor Campbell, Pastor Ganeer, and the new churches that have been launched out. Let's pray for those who have, uh, amen, filled their positions. They needed a new door director, and they needed also a new follow-up person. And we're going to pray for those families, those couples, and we're going to also believe God for uh, the Suspanskis and the Kings in Jacksonville. And let's also pray for my pastor, Pastor Keith, for Kerry Sullivan, his wife, that God blesses them, that God is in control and uh, helping them with their new building. Perhaps you have a need in your life that I did not mention right now. I want you to lift your hand uh, and we want to pray with you. Amen. God sees your hands as they're being raised. Amen. We have some other requests here. We're going to pray for our uh, first responders in Greece, those who are uh, on the front lines, laboring, amen, those who are, uh, you know, sacrificing the best years of their lives. We have uh, police officers, firefighters, EMTs, and we're going to pray for them that God overshadows their life and blesses their families. We're going to pray for Jimmy Gonzalez. Uh, let's lift up uh, uh, Colby and Laura Generous, amen, that God works in their behalf. Amen. A young lady by the name of Bethany came out a few weeks ago to church. We're going to lift up Brian and Lily. Amen. Let's believe God together for miracles and all that God wants to accomplish this morning. Amen. Let's believe God if you're listening online right now and you have a need in your body, maybe you're sick uh, or you're infirmed, we're going to pray with you that you can recover, amen, and that God can move in your life and bless you and save you, amen, those that are backslidden, let's pray that God gives favor and grace and mercy on this wonderful day filled with power, and let's go ahead and pray and ask Barry to open us up in prayer when we subside, amen. Lord, we thank you, God. We're going to believe you, God, for the miracles that you promised us, God, move powerfully here in Greece, New York, Lord God, we pray for our mother church in Rochester, God, we're asking to move upon all their new converts uh, to make good decisions, Lord, uh, we're praying for your Holy Ghost uh, to anoint our lives, make us a fruitful people, God, help us to conquer every ill habit, uh, all sickness and disease and everything that detracts from your testimony, Lord God. Anoint our life with power, God. I pray you move this morning, God. Help us to treat people different, God. Help us to get a vision for the lost, God. Help us to become obedient to all you've called us to. I so thank you for your spirit in this place. Shed it about we hope that you lift us up and bring us to become the people that you want us to be, that we're following your way, and we will continue to follow that path. We also ask that you lift up those that need to be and help them find their way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's praise God together. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's great to see everybody here. Let's take a minute to greet one another. Make everybody feel welcome.
Shortly, we're going to make a few announcements for the local congregation. And that is that on uh, this night at 5.30, we'll be in prayer here. Once again, we have a second service. We want to invite you to that. Amen. All day for Jesus, we call that. And uh, midweek service on this uh, this Wednesday at 7.30, 6.30 is our time of prayer. Amen. We're going to believe God for more miracles. Let's see, uh, this Saturday, I do believe we have a movie night. Amen. We'd like to invite you that. We'll be starting that at 7 o'clock. Amen. Prompt, bring the popcorn and the sugar, the uh, chocolate cup. Bring all your Easter candy. What the heck? I know. <laughs> you know? Yeah. There's nothing left. Be liberal. <laughs> Praise God. And then we're going to start up all over again next week. Uh, next month, we're having an open jam, I believe, on uh, the 14th. And we're also going to be having a home Bible study. Uh, praise God. 20 want to give a short testimony about what happened last week. We went to conference. Me and my wife were there. We had 17 sermons. Um, was a glorious time, and it's so exciting to see uh, people that I've known that have been uh, pastoring and that is to preach like they have uh, such a depth of knowledge and experience and anointing. It's very encouraging to me. I also want to uh, let you know that I testified about you guys. Uh, you might want to watch it on uh, the Monday night service. If you want to go to a Victory Chapel, you can see that. And I had to give a testimony in front of the entire conference body about what God is doing here in Greece. I was very much afraid. Hallelujah. But God helped me oh, not to stutter good. too much. And uh, praise God. In the course of the week, we um, were able to send out two brand new churches. Amen. Let's praise God for that. Thank you. Two brothers from Cape Cod, the Hyannis Church, were sent out to other cities there. Um, you can begin to pray for my brother Jason Winslow and his family. He's going to a different city. It's like an hour from um, the Cape. Um, and he's starting a new business. He's moving his family. They're buying a house. And so we need God to move in their behalf and to help them, to encourage them to Help them to make contact with people. Help them to get people saved. Amen. And find a building and all these kind of things cost money. Amen. And if you will begin to think about uh, the vision of our fellowship, and that is to preach the gospel and to make disciples and ultimately to plant churches. That's what we do in this church. That's basically our overshadowing vision. That's why I'm here, because we were sent from Rochester to Greece to start this church. We've been on support. Thankfully, last year, we, I was able to, with the help of God, um, get on half support. So right now, we are on half support of our mother church. We're working towards fully being self-supporting. And that doesn't mean to be separated from our mother church, but that means to, that we're going to grow up. And all of you that are tithing and you're um, paying, you know, you're offering money to God, that is so helpful and that is what we're called to do because the tithes are holy and offerings besides. And I'd like to use by way of illustration here on Easter, uh, the sacrifice of these Polish moms who were leaving strollers for Ukrainian moms crossing the border. More than 1.5 million people have fled Ukraine since the Russian invasion began, according to the head of the UN Refugee Agency, many of whom are women and children. Mm -hmm. Across the border in Poland, fellow moms are stepping up to help. A now, now viral photo shows a line of fully equipped strollers waiting for Ukrainian moms at the train station at the border crossing Medica, Poland. The strollers were placed there by Polish mothers who, according to Francesco Malovata, the photographer captured the video. The thing that struck me before taking the photo was the absence of people around, while two meters away there were miles of people. 
It seemed surreal, Maltoba told ABC News by email. I thought of them both about the solidarity of those who brought the strollers and the dramatic stories of mothers feeling the war. Amen. Here is an opportunity for you and I to link hearts together, amen, to build this church, but also, and then thinking about other people, we can think about those two churches that were planted. And if God would impress upon you that need to help support them, amen, you can put a check in, if not tonight or maybe the next time you come to church, to support them. And write on there that that is for baby churches, those in two new churches that we're launching. Amen. I'm going to ask the usher to come forward right now. Let's give to God. If you can pay uh, something above and beyond your tithe and invest in uh, evangelism, world evangelism, moving out of ourselves, out of our comfort zone. And like these Polish mothers, they had to step up and they had to help. They created a solidarity and a purpose for what God is doing, you know, wants to help those children, those mothers, and some are orphaned. And let's think also about giving to the work of God. Amen. Be liberal. God loves a cheerful giver. Brother David, can you pray for the offering? Yeah, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity. We thank you for caring for us, for meeting our needs, for yes, Lord. making sure that we have enough to do what you call us to do. We thank you that we're able to give to you and trust that you will bless us for your purpose. Amen. Praise God. Thank you. You can click the link online if you'd like to make your donation. Amen. Would you be free? Would you be free from your passion? Peter, we greatly appreciate your help to our service. Happy Easter. Amen. Jesus is alive. Amen. On Resurrection Sunday, we're going to talk about uh, the crucifixion of Jesus. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew 27, verse 27 through 31. We're going to read that in a moment here. The crucifixion of Jesus occurred in the first century. Judea, most likely in either A.D. 30 or A.D. 33, Jesus' crucifixion is described in great detail in the four Gospels referred to in the New Testament epistles that were attested to by other ancient sources and considered an established historical event by many, although there's no consensus among historians on the exact details. We have, amen, the exact details right here. Yep. Scripture teaches us exactly what went down there. We have four different views of Jesus and uh, the crucifixion, amen, and many concur. And it's kind of like an event where you would have uh, somebody brought to court for a crime and you would bring witnesses forward. And they all might have different stories. They all might have different perspectives. But you know beyond the shadow of a doubt exactly what happened in the end. Amen. Let's read our scripture, Matthew 27, verses 27 through 31. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. 
They stripped him of his clothes and put on a scarlet robe. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and uh, gave him a reed in his hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him then and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for Holy Scripture and how you have detailed the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus. God, change our lives today forevermore, God, and help us to realize your great love for humanity. We're thankful to you, God. Open our ears to the sayings of Jesus on the cross. Amen. I've entitled this On the Cross Sayings of Jesus because you could write a whole <coughs> Sunday school that would go on for months about what Jesus said on the cross. But we're going to look at a few of them because you and I have many needs in our life. And the first need we're going to look at is forgiveness. And then all of our, uh, each and every one of us here find ourselves in the same boat. And we're in a sinking ship because our lives has been affected by sin. Sin erodes and sin uh, pumps holes in our boat and our life. And we find ourselves, each and every one of us, guilty of sin. Our boats are sinking. We have chosen freely by willful disobedience to disobey God and to do exactly the opposite of what he has told us to do. Instead of living God's way, we are living our way. Amen? It is natural. It's a natural way of living. It's our base nature. It's our sin nature. We choose to do what feels good to us, what is natural, what comes freely, and what flows through us. Amen? And many times can be very detrimental to our relationships when you say things to people or when you do things, when you uh, hit them uh, physically or verbally abuse them. Amen. It affects our relationships. And so what Jesus has accomplished on the cross is critical for your relationships, the people that you live with. Amen. Whether it's a spouse, your family, people on your job. Amen. We need to be right with other people. And many times we do fail, amen, but we do have an opportunity to get right with other people. Seeking forgiveness. We have our spouse, amen, uh, family, we have coworkers, your boss, friends, you have a church family here, amen. Because why? Why is it so important? Relationships are what life is all about. People in your life, amen. That's why you're here, amen, to have relationships and right relationships and especially a right relationship with our maker, amen. Thirdly, you know God delights in saving people. He desires that all men would be saved. The Bible teaches us he's not willing that any should perish. God doesn't get a kick out of sending people to hell. Do you know that? He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He has compassion on people. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes on him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. God has a way, amen, to show us that he loves us. And that was through his sacrifice on the cross. Amen. I want to encourage you. And especially for those who are uh, going through periods in your life of despair. Amen. All these things I'm referring to right now, Jesus has gone through and given us the answer to that 
whatever dilemma that you're going through, chaos or confusion, the problems you have in your life, the answers are found in what Jesus said on the cross. He's here this morning to encourage you. Because why? We all go through periods of despair. We need to realize that God is aware of you know, all of those situations. He doesn't miss a thing. He's not some sleepy old guy up in heaven creating other universes, dealing with other people. No, he's here right now. He knows the number of hairs on your head. Amen. And uh, the cares, the things that you're going through, it doesn't miss his uh, vision. He, it's like, you know, he's aware of all your problems. He knows the sorrow that you're going through. And he wants to encourage you in every situation. He will send the Holy Spirit. He will send hope and he will send help. Amen. We need to be forgiven. God is in the position to forgive all of us. Even though we are willfully going against him and doing our own thing. And sometimes there are sins. David prayed for those ignorant sins. You know, King David in the, in the Old Testament, he said, you know, in one of his prayers and sounds, forgive me of sins, of things that I'm not even aware of. Things that I don't even know that I said that. I don't know that I hurt that person. He's saying that there are sometimes sins that you are involved in and you're ignorant of them. But you can be forgiven Amen. Jesus said on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing as they were crucifying him, as they were beating him. They had no idea who he was. And so, you know, there's people in your life too that we need to forgive. Amen. They may not be aware of what they're really doing. So there's sins and sins of ignorance, amen. All of us need that, amen. Can anybody say amen in here? I mean, we make mistakes. We say the wrong things many times or we do make bad investments or do, you know, wickedness and we need to be forgiven, amen. Praise God. God wants to give you an assurance, amen, that he is here and that he is here for you, amen, and definitely that you have been forgiven of your sins, what a joy it is when you give your life to Jesus and surrender your all to him. Amen. God wants to give an assurance to you. You put your confidence in his blood sacrifice. I'm reading a book uh, this whole week. It was kind of like smoking crack. Many of you have not done many drugs like that. But it was addictive. I wanted to go from one chapter to the next. I couldn't put the book down. And so the the inventor of my pillow does anybody own a my pillow in here? You do. Yes. Praise yes. God. We're having a confessional service this morning. <laughs> but the my pillow was invented by a crack addict. You guys remember that? Oh yeah. Yes. So if you read the book, I've been reading a book. I couldn't put the book down. So he had a horrible life, you know, of course, and just abused his family, his kids, his wife, and. Anyway, comes up with this great idea and starts this, this company, but that wasn't the end of his crack addiction. So he's still using crack. He's like functioning like a normal person. Many people do this. They're, they're functioning alcoholics. or In this case, he was a functioning crackhead and was able to bring the kids to their football games and you know, go hunting with the kids and you know, be a, you know, bring home the, the money and so on. But anyway, so my point here is that he really, he didn't really get saved, but he got off the stuff. One day he woke up, he said, I'm all done with this. And that was, it happened a few times in his life where he said, I'm done, I'm quitting. But there was another time when he said, I'm quitting. And he actually did quit smoking crack. And he was being drawn towards Jesus, but he really never had a relationship. It took him a few more years after that to really surrender everything to God. I mean, he stopped smoking crack. He stopped, um, you know, living immoral. And he still had some baggage and so on. But the day that he gave his life to Jesus, amen, he could feel, he could sense that he was truly forgiven and uh, amen. He's given many speeches, and some of you know about that. And the comfortable work, the pillow is pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> Helps you to fall asleep. When we put our confidence in the blood sacrifice, we have power. Revelation 12 talks about overcoming the devil and, uh, uh, you know, 
getting right with God, overcoming that we have overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb. Because there's power in the blood. Amen. Jesus was holy and the blood that he shed has power to break sin and break addictions in your life. Amen. And the word of our testimony also helps us to overcome the devil. That is the way that you're living, the way that you're repenting. Putting faith in Jesus assures us of his provision. And then he's going to take care of your needs. He's going to help you to pay your bills. And then he's going to feed you and clothe you. Yes, he's going to secondly protect you from the devil, from yourself, your old man that's inside that rises up that wants to ruin you as a Christian. Amen. He wants to protect you from outside influences, whether it be social media or something that comes through false doctrine or strange ideas through the TV or through the internet, through movies. He wants to protect you. Amen. And he wants to thirdly give you prospects. Amen. That means future victory of fruitfulness. Amen. Lastly, I'd like to point out that Jesus completely died. He expired 100%. You know through the Muslim faith, they don't believe that Jesus died on the cross. They believe that uh, Allah would not allow his holy prophet to be so humiliated. And so they believe that uh, an angel swooped down at the last second and whisked the, you know, the prophet away to some place of safety. But you and I know that Jesus was hung naked. Amen. He was crucified like a common criminal. And he died. And if that's not enough, amen, they took a spear and they thrust it in his side. Water and blood came out. Amen. Holy Scripture records that Jesus completely expired through crucifixion. Without which, think about it, if Jesus never died, then you and I are still in our sins. We still have a serious problem. We're on our way to hell. There's no hope for us if Jesus <laughs> never did die. Because it was required that a sin sacrifice would be made for the remission of sins, for the lifting away of sins, for the covering of sins, for the elimination of the power of sin in our life. Amen. There's no other perfect sacrifice except Jesus. Every Christian without that perfect sacrifice would have no hope. They would be still living in their sins. Amen. Fourthly, we need to be loving each other Amen. The Christian needs to love other people. Even sinners, dare I say. Even your enemies. Jesus taught us. Amen. As we see demonstrated in the cross. And especially to take care of your families. Amen. We have many people today, uh, fathers, absent fathers from homes that are very good at making babies, but not very good at raising children and uh, supporting their families. We see a giant hole there. Whether it's they're completely out of the house, maybe they moved out to another relationship, or maybe they're absent, they're working too much, they're not really in the home raising their families. Well, the Bible says that uh, they're worse than a heathen if you're not taking care of your family. So we see this idea of providing for other people, and we're going to see and discover that Jesus did the same, even on the cross. And lastly, we're dead to sin. How many believe that you are completely dead to sin? 100%, amen. The Bible says that, uh, amen, because of Jesus' sacrifice, in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's kind of like the gavel came down in the courtroom. You're forgiven. Jesus, amen, took your punishment upon himself. And you are innocent. You can go. Amen. That's being dead to sin. And if God forgets us, 
that our, our sins have been just demolished. They're obliterated. They are nowhere to be found as far as the east is from the west. Amen. Thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. If God forgets them, then so should we. Many people like to hold on to their sins. Oh, you don't know what I've done, Pastor. You don't know how what a wicked person I've been. Well, I know God does, but he's forgiven you. He's eliminated those sins. And if you believe it, amen, you can be saved. Hallelujah. Let's secondly look at the sayings of Jesus on the cross. Because all those issues I was talking about earlier are given an answer for us or direction. Jesus is speaking to us from the cross. From the book of Matthew, let's look firstly at this phrase, why have you forsaken me? In Matthew 27, verse 45, now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness all over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Amen. Because God cannot be in the presence of sin. Amen. At that moment in time, most scholars believe that the sins of entire humanity were placed on Jesus at that time, and his father took off. Amen. His father left him all alone there. God cannot be in the presence of sin. So Jesus, at that moment, took all the sins of every human being upon himself. His father left him. <coughs> Can you imagine that? I mean, Jesus, you know, Jesus and the Father, they're one, right? And so here, psh, they're separated. He no longer has him with him, living inside his heart at that moment. Can you imagine the excruciating pain when somebody leaves you, they have a close family member or somebody dies, and you feel that pain while you're being ripped apart from them? Jesus did that knowing that at that moment in time he would be alone. But it seems like maybe the 100% part of Jesus who was a man wasn't quite prepared for that. He screamed out, God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Because he loves you. He put you ahead of his relationship with his father. Amen. He screamed with a loud voice, Matthew 27, 47. Some of those who stood there when they heard that, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it up to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come and save him. In verse 50, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, yielded up his spirit. And then I was kind of thinking about this and, you know, sometimes we have a freedom to imagine and to use our creative energies. And I was imagining that at that time, what if Jesus was saying, I forgive you, Melissa. I forgive you, David. I forgive you, Barry. I forgive you, Paul Van Epps. What if he was just saying that personally to me? And that's what he meant when he died. What an amazing concept. Since what was said the second time was not recorded, they don't know what he said, but it was a loud voice as if he wanted us to hear from thousands of miles away in Israel, in Jerusalem, outside the city on a hill called Golgotha, the place of the skull. From thousands of years ago, he wanted you to hear that. Even this morning. Praise God that we can hear that saying and take it personally to heart that through Jesus' obedient sacrifice, we can experience his forgiveness and become one with him and become one with his Father. Amen. 
This second point is that the book of Mark echoes pretty much the exact same knowledge or information is shared with us with what Jesus said from the book of Matthew. And when I studied the book of Luke also, you and I are going to go through despair. And Jesus talks about, you know, having things not, not go your way. Luke 23, 27 through 30, and a great multitude of the people follow Jesus. This is his, when, when he's on the road uh, to Calvary. He's left the praetorium. He's left the, uh, the, um, the palace of Pilate, and he's on this road. And people are following Jesus. They're mourning and lamenting him. Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren, wombs that never bore, and breasts that never nursed. And they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. And that Jesus is referring to a time of great desperation. Uh, A.D. 70, Jerusalem was sacked, amen, and completely wiped out. And, amen, there was much pain to go through, amen. Secondly, from the book of Luke, we see this whole idea of ignorant sin. Amen. In Luke 23, verses 32 through 34, there were two other criminals led with Jesus to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Golgotha, or Calvary, excuse me, where they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left hand, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. Jesus is praying to his heavenly Father to forgive those who were torturing him. Those who were spitting on him. Those who were whipping him. Within inches of his death. Those who were laughing at him. He saved others. He, why don't he let him save himself? Mocking him. Laughing at him. He could have called down a legion of angels to wipe them out. <sighs> Be gone. And he could have gotten revenge on them, but he did the opposite. He's calling on his father to forgive them. Amen. He's demonstrating to us what it's like to be a Christian. Amen. Thirdly, we have an assurance that, amen, our faith comes first before